certain age may remember our next contestant from such TV series as Knott's Landing, Rich Man, Poor Man, Crazy Like a Fox, or The Tony Randall Show. But if you don't, she says no problem. She's of a certain age herself and isn't sure she remembers them either. <laughs> she shamelessly urges you to visit her web new website, sonnetsforsale.com. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Penny Pizer. dodge his sickle's reap, and let me slip away incognito. I hope if death has plans for my demise, may they not be the kind inscribed in stone, but just a concept I could help revise. I just assume he'd leave poor me alone. I hear to strike a deal with death is hard, a tough negotiation at the least. He rarely hoists himself on his petard. I'm guessing more than once his palms have been greased. Despite my valiant efforts to forestall, let's face it, I'm a goner, aren't we all? <laughs> Death comes unexpectedly. That's the only line I remember from Pollyanna. <laughs> I know there was a lot of blonde hair, blue eyes, and prisms, but Carl Malden's Death Comes Unexpectedly was my big Disney takeaway. Not what my parents or Uncle Walt were hoping for. I decided that if I expected death, he, and I decided he was decidedly he, might not be so eager to visit little me or mine. So began a lifetime of being on the lookout. It didn't help that my dad was a life insurance salesman for many years and was up close and personal with the actuarial tables. <laughs> Sitting around the only table I understood, the kitchen table, I heard words like predecease, <laughs> life expectancy. <laughs> What's predecease, Daddy? Well, Penny, if you die before your sister, what? Why can't she die first? <laughs> well, I suppose she could, but just for an example, why should I die before Penny? She's older. My sister Carolyn piped up. I wanted to know why they didn't call it death insurance, and I wanted some. <laughs> I thought this insurance might be a good idea for animals, since animals kicking the bucket were the only such events I had experienced at that point. From the baby bunny we found in the yard and tried unsuccessfully to resuscitate in a shoebox, <laughs> to Mac, our beagle, who met an untimely, unexpected end. I was not certain how to react to these finalities. I thought the bunny's death deserved at least a sad face for most of the morning. But in the end, it was a bunny I didn't know real well. When Mac bought the farm, I looked to my siblings for a cue on how to react. I would have gone along with anything. Tears, screams, loud, oh no's, but we were a pretty subdued group. Some might say repressed. <laughs> <laughs> then one Easter morning, death got more personal. My mother assembled us to say, Pappy, our grandpa, who we love very much, died this morning. I put my head down in embarrassment because I thought I should cry, but I couldn't. I just turned red and almost giggled. My siblings did the same. I was lost. My mother wasn't crying. Or was she? Dad had gone into the city early to be with our grandmother, and I noticed the Easter Bunny was conspicuously absent as well. That in itself was a little death. And in my selfish childhood way, I thought it was unfair that Pappy's demise had to get in the way of a good egg hunt. I mean, he was dead, but he was still coming back next weekend with cake and presents, right? This was some strange reworking of the resurrection. <laughs> At the cemetery, watching the solemn expressions on my father and uncle's faces, I didn't feel worthy of being there. My grandmother, Muggsy, was going through a lot of Kleenex and staring into that strange rectangular hole. When it was over, I warily approached her, and she took my hands 
my face in her hands, the first time I'd experienced that gesture. You won't forget Pappy, will you? I was beginning to get the idea. No mugs. I don't know when my dad first had his intro to death, but days after arriving in Europe during World War II, he and his platoon, who were referred to as replacements, arrived at a location where they were ordered to unload a truck. Upon opening the doors, Sergeant Pizer encountered a pile of dead GIs. No warning, just unload this truck. After laying the bodies on the ground, my future dad and his men climbed into that same truck and headed out to the front. Replacements. My father's takeaway from the war, every day you wake up is a good one. When my son Buck was born, I gazed across our heart hospital room at his already determined face, and filled with postpartum nests, I thought, he is going to be so sad when I die. <laughs> about his well-being and released me beautifully from my concerns by saying, you're worried about me dying. Don't. War is a young person's game. You know you're going to die, but we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Something about that did reassure me. <laughs> Death is theoretical for me. Not so for my sister, who was crippled with MS and now speaks matter-of-factly about her shortened time on this earth walk. I'm not proud of this, but there was a recent eight-year period when Carolyn and I didn't see each other for all, and almost never spoke. You see, she chose a very different path than the rest of the Pizer tribe. In fact, her name no longer is Pizer, it's Abiti, a name she apparently sent away for. <laughs> and her name isn't Carolyn anymore. It's Muna, previously Morgaus, previously Saskia, all names her guru, Umi, gave her. I was indignant and outraged by this rejection of our family and our ways, and the fact that long ago she had stricken sirloin and malamars from her diet. <laughs> Talk about severing ties to find. <laughs> On these grounds, basically, I decided I would have nothing to do with her, and I refused, I tell you, refused to call her by any of her ridiculous names. I was justified in my withdrawal debt. I should mention that Carolyn was deliberate in her withdrawal as well, for reasons she'd have to explain. But after eight years, I wasn't right. I was ashamed. I called her up, made the trip to see her. We stared at each other. Eight years gone. She's my sister. What was I thinking, that this will last forever? Shrunken in her wheelchair, she weighed God knows how little. Hi, Mona, I said. Math's not my thing, but I know this equation. Death equals not enough time. There are only a certain number of heartbeats were allotted. At the rate I'm going, I don't have quite enough heartbeats to figure it all out. I feel a song coming on. <laughs> <laughs> It's so peaceful and bright, but I know all's not right as I sit on this wobbly chair and think about death. <laughs> With every breath I take, I think about death. <laughs> it's sick, but it's true. My shrink thinks I'm upbeat, or so I tweet. He's clueless. The problem's not <laughs> I think about death. And you, <laughs> I dream about death. <laughs> and a plethora of stuff all related to death. And everything.
anything that could possibly go wrong. I visualize the end of things, the demise of kings. Even when the skies are blue, I think about death. <laughs> and you. <laughs> All flowers wilt, and I'm off kilter, wondering why. When lightning strikes and cars come crashing, hey, we're all gonna die. <laughs> Happiness is possible only if you're willing to be a happy stiff. So dead <laughs> won't ruin your life. I worry about death <laughs> and how the end will come. I tend to depress all of my friends to shore. Maybe my karma's weak, the subject's bleak. I always take the graveyard tours. I think of my death and yours. <laughs> when I'm with you, I should be happy, never upset. You smile and put your arms around me. I love you, and yet, when the lights are low, baby, and we're getting undressed, I'm planning a double funeral. I'm a tad obsessed with death. And you, my wonderful outlook on life, is death. That's my life. I'm not going to try and follow that with anything. <laughs> <laughs> I have an intermission for 15 minutes. We'll see you back.